then it, it's more manageable that way. Um, these are some of the little tools that we've come up with with a siphon. You guys probably all use that. Use the siphon to siphon out dead eggs. Um, the little spoon thing there is just a little screen uh, spoon thing for scooping up, you know, fungus eggs. And it's <coughs> These are glass bell jars. They're, in my opinion, they're better than anything else that's out there, but you can't get them anymore. Um, screen size. Um, on So uh, these fry are going to hatch it into your tank. You don't want your fry going. Uh, you guys, again, are probably, done, probably telling you stuff you already know, but um, the screen size we use is called the, is a 30 by 30, and that has to do with the number of strands in an inch. And then, the, then there's a 0 0.012, and that's the whole size opening. Um, we get we get this stuff from Barrier Wire. I think they're from somewhere. So we'll use that same screen on our hatching tanks. We'll use it on our ponds, and we'll use it on our intensive tanks, which we'll see for a little later on. Uh, well, I. Fry inventory. So this is. Did anybody have any questions on egg incubation at all? Can you repeat that? And any questions on egg incubation oh. before we get to? Yeah, yeah sorry, sure. Yeah, I do have some notes on that, and and, and I'm sure everything's a little bit different at your <coughs> at your hatchery. Um, One thing that comes up is how do you treat uh, fungus for your eggs? Okay, so so for us, we don't like handling any more chemicals than we have to, so we don't use formaldehyde at all. What about peroxide? Too? Uh, we're not allowed to use peroxide. Are we? So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you guys can. Yeah, we're not we're not allowed to. Um, I'm not sure why, but uh, um, so the way we manage it, and we've got a lot of jars to deal with, we manage it by by siphoning and picking and just keeping ahead of it that way. And again, because we're collecting so many eggs, we have the luxury of being uh, fairly aggressive when we're, when we're siphoning off eggs. And I know when you've only got just enough eggs, you're, you're trying to keep everything you've got, and I can, I can appreciate that. Um, but if you've got enough people, enough volunteers, if you can, if you can manage it just by siphoning and picking, uh, I, I suggest that, because there's always dangers in the eggs. I don't know what the concentrations are of peroxide. I believe the concentration of uh, formaldehyde is like a one to 600 uh, drip for 15 minutes. So you have to calculate your flow that's going through your system and it's like a one to 600 ratio of the, of the formaldehyde. Have you done any, uh, have you any problems with uh, the screens clogging with egg casings and things like that? Yep. Is that just a yep. manual thing of keeping yep. it clean or not any other secrets to that? Yeah, I got I got no I got no secrets there, uh, no ideas other than um, one one thing I've heard of and I've never really heard whether it's successful or not is to make like a little um, bubble screen. So if your screen is vertical, if you can put like a little diffuser in front of it, it'll it'll apparently wash the egg shells and keep them away from the screen. But again, it depends how much water is flowing through your system if, if that's aggressive enough to keep the shells off. Of it. We have to siphon and clean daily or sometimes three or four times a day if they're in a, in a big hatch. Yeah. What was the size of that screen again? Uh, it's called 30 by 30 by 0 0.1 or 0 0.012. 30 by 30 by 0.012. <coughs> for eggs in the hatchery? Uh, yes, yeah, so I do have a note on that, I kind of missed that. Um, I know it's 
generally 15 to 20 days. Um, shouldn't exceed 15 Celsius. Um, having said that, you also, at the time of pass, you want you want to try to be as close to whatever your pond temperature is that they're going into at the same time. So, so for us, uh, we draw our water from the lake and at at that time of year, the ice has gone off the lake and the lake is kind of gradually warming up like the wood in the wild. So we're fortunate that um, our incubation temperatures are kind of gradually warming up um, sort of to that 15 degree mark. And our ponds, I believe, at that same time, even though we're using the same water, um, because there's such a small amount of water going through the ponds, the ponds tend to warm up more. So I think our ponds are around 18 or 19 degrees and our, our hash temperature is around 15 degrees. So it's kind of a gradual temperature from, I think about six degrees when we first collect the eggs, and it gradually increases over that 15 to, in our case, it's about 25 days, uh, up to 15 degrees Celsius. Um, we've, we've, and some of the Kingston folks will know this, um, We've got a whole bunch of other programs going on in the spring, um, stocking all kinds of stuff with some on, and we're trying to get our ponds in, and we're trying to spawn walleye and, and do all kinds of stuff. So we've played with temperatures a little bit. We've actually cooled everything down to buy us more time because we're scrambling to get things together. Um, and I think it was sometime in early June, wasn't it? Floyd? Yeah, June 13th. June 13th. <laughs> so, so normally, normally for us, our hatch date is for May long weekend. I remember that uh, I remember the mail on weekend, but um, but we we strung it out, and I don't think that was necessarily the best thing. Um, we were, like I say, we were scrambling to get, um, as you'll see, our intensive culture system set up and our ponds in and all that. So, so you can string it out, um, but there's probably a sort of an optimal optimal time, and I would assume optimal time and temperature is what's happening in the wild. Um, okay, so we'll talk, start talking about the fry a little bit. Um, you want uh, the strongest fry possible to put in your ponds or in your in intensive culture if you're going to try that. Um, so what we do is uh, uh, we, we take note of the hatch date and we won't use any of those fry until 24 hours after the hatch because um, often some of the weaker fry will die over that 24 hour period and if you use them as part of your numbers then you're probably going to have a higher mortality in your ponds or in your, in your intensive system. So after 24 hours you should be left with um, some nice strong healthy fry. Um, again if, you, if you've got that luxury. Um, I think a lot of times what happens is if, if, if people start to get a little bit nervous when they're hatching and you're worried that you're going to lose them all and you put them in right away and then you may or may not have success in your pond and you're often wondering why. And it likely has something to do with the newly hatched fry. Because a lot of them will die within that first 24 hours. Um, and not only that, if a lot of those fry die in your pond, then your, your pond uh, can be completely out of balance. So you've got way more productivity going on in your pond and you have fry and things can get way out of balance. You can you can have algae blooms and plankton growth and it can and it can cause uh, oxygen crashes and all kinds of nasty stuff. So uh, the problem just gets uh, exaggerated right from the time you put in that unhealthy fry from day one. Does that make sense? Um, so enumerating fry um, one of the methods is, again, very similar to the volumetric method that we use for eggs. So we'll put, we'll put just a little bit of water in this and we'll put uh, one or two mils of fry in this little guy. Kind of let them settle. Um, it's kind of a crude method because fry are kind of swimming around. It's hard to see a line in there, but you gotta, gotta make a judgment call. You dump the fry out, you count them, and then you do it the same way with the larger one when you're measuring your total volume. And again, it's a judgment call because you're putting you know, tens of thousands of fry in this little container, and you're trying to get them to settle down, and they won't. And you're trying to get a line on there where the line is, and again, it's a judgment call, um, and that gives you an idea of the number of, of fry that you're putting in your ponds or in your intensive system. 
So uh, it's a little bit crude, but um, again, if if the person that's doing it is consistent, um, that's probably the most important factor in that. Uh, the other method that we're playing with is this, this animal here. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend rushing out and buying one just yet. But this is a, this is a fry counter. Um, and it seems to, it seems to work pretty good. Um, but we're not confident in its numbers just yet. But basically the way it works, um, there's a little plate. For we fill this hopper up full of water and there's water constantly flowing into it and the water going into it has to go through a really fine micro and screen because if there's any particles in there, it'll count the particles as fry. Um, so water's constantly flowing in this, you keep adding that to the fry in here. And down below here, um, they're funneled down in, they go through a plate that there's eight holes in it, and the holes are small enough so that only one fry, uh, one fry can go through a hole at a time. And you can see there's eight tubes here. So the fry are constantly running out of this. And if you watch this little counter, you can see the numbers climbing. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, but like any piece of technology, it's got its glitches. So, um, so as you're approaching your target number for your pond, for example, you'll, you'll basically you'll start lifting up some of these hoses so you're not all, all operating and eventually you'll get down to one hose and just counting one fry at a time. So it can be pretty accurate if it's working properly. But like I said, I don't crash it from the just yet. Well, they have, sir. Have you sold yet? Yeah, yeah, so I mean it was $3,500. <laughs> Everything's so thirty five hundred dollars. Depending on what fry you're doing, it probably gets you a little bit The road's more. Yeah. Probably gets you a little bit more. It's a system for counting fry sugar. It's to fry sugar too small for this. Yeah. I thought it was just fry sugar. And the other disadvantage to it, it takes a long time. Um, our ponds were seeding anywhere from uh, 65 to 85,000 fry in, in our ponds, and it takes about 45 minutes to count one pond's worth. So it's it's fairly low stress on the fry because they're not at they're not at super high densities like they are in the graduated cylinder. So they're running through, uh, so it, it, it's just time consuming. And again, if you don't have perfectly clean water or if there's any tiny little air bubbles getting in there somehow, it would count the air bubbles too. That's right. So, like I say, let, let us uh, be the guinea pigs on that and we can we can let you know if we like it or don't like it. So. Can I back you up a bit? Yeah. Um, back to the eggs in the jars. Yeah. Uh, pre hatching uh, how, how long do you figure from the time in the jar with your temperature control? Say 19 degrees is optimal, 15 is when you... Yeah, it, it gradually increases, so it's not yeah. always 19, but yeah. Sure. What time frame are we looking at? So, uh, our... Five, five days, I think it's it. Uh, the Blue Jays is 15 to 20 days, Blue Jay Creek. That's the other station. 15 to 20. 15 to 20 days. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what their temperature regime is through that period. Uh, ours um, ours starts off at six degrees and gradually increases to about fifteen degrees. And our collection on the Bay of Quinney is around April thirteenth to fifteenth. And uh, we expect them to hatch around the May long the May long weekend, weekend so around May twentieth to twenty fourth somewhere in there. So what's that? That's about 30, 33 days for us. Okay. And after you hatch. Before you put them in your pond? 24 hours. Minimum, 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like I say, if, if you put newly hatched fry in your ponds, I have no idea what, what will happen. You might lose half of them right in that first 24 hours. Yeah, it's pretty crucial. Huh? Yeah, it is. It is for sure. Yeah. And like I say, that affects, that affects everything else in your pond. So what you thought you might have started with 65,000 prime, you might only been 30,000 prime. It floats 
And you might and then you might wonder why is it such a bad algae or why you know why is our pond why did our pond pond crash and all that kind of stuff. So so it's, so it's a pretty important step. Have you played at all with keeping them after they hatch, keeping them in the jars or in a container for longer than 24 hours to see if there's a long term survival? Like, is there any um, experience in that area? We do kind of, because well, we're, we're doing some intensive trials where we put them in tanks and we start feeding them so it's not quite the same thing because we're yeah. presenting them with food right away. Yeah. Um, we have kept, we have, you know, kept fry, like if we had some extra fry in the tank and we've dealt with with everything that we've had. Um, there's been some fry left over, but I can't, I, I couldn't provide you with an estimate of how many actually continue to die. I, I don't know. Like if you left them three or four days before you put them in the pond, would you have better survival rate, do you think? Or it uh, I think I think if you do that, then they're gonna start to cannibalize yeah. almost right away. Unless you feed them. Yeah, unless you feed them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or die. Yeah. yeah, if they've only got about three or four days before they die, that's when they're going to, depending on temperature, yeah. um, before they die. Um, and they will cannibalize quick. Yeah. Um, these are some of our pond designs. Um, the, the sort of the teardrop shape seems to be kind of um, one of the sort of the better designs. Um, the, the bright blue ones are blue day creeks. They're much larger than ours. Ours are the ones that are uh, these ones over here that are empty. Um, you can see ours have a, a concrete bottom in the middle, and then the outer part is um, is tilled up soil. Um, these four skinny ones, they, they were experimental walleye ponds. We don't use them anymore for walleye. Um, ours don't have a catchment basin in the bottom. Blue jays do. So uh, our harvest method is to drain them down and take, get insane nets. Um, and that's kind of why the concrete bottom is there, is to help us deal with that. I know some of the bent crop or Halliburton guys have kind of a uh, soily bottom uh, pond. It's kind of hard to harvest, and they're going to modify that. Um, Blue Jays has a catchment basin so they can drain them all down and they, they put a shade, a shade uh, tarp over the catchment basin and the wall they want to get out of the sun so they'll kind of swarm towards the catchment basin they drain their ponds down and they just net them right out of the catchment basin so um, kind of a couple different designs that's their catchment basin on the top here um, so uh, our method of, of sort of pond preparation and fertilization, um, we'll till up the, the outer edge. We've got a rear time tiller for a tractor that we go around and kind of turn everything in. We'll do that in the fall before we fill up the ponds for the winter because the cement bottles will leave. We do that in the fall and then we empty them in the spring and we do it again in the spring, till them up in the spring. Um, we'll do a dry application of soybean uh, fertilization. I don't know if this is anywhere else, these, these sort of standard rates, but we'll, this, the standard rate um, to fertilize is seven, 17 grams of dry, dry fertilizer per cubic meter of volume per week. So, um, so to back up, the initial fertilizer, or the initial application of dry fertilizer is four times that amount. Okay, so we'll, we'll till up our ponds, we'll take bags of dry soybean, weigh it out depending on the volume of each pond, spread it around the tilled up soil area, and then we'll fill up our pond. And that takes place a week to two weeks before we're going to put our fry in our ponds. And that gives the pond time to um, start as production of phytoplankton and zooplankton. So, how deep are your ponds? Um, at the bottom end where the screen is, it's about seven feet. Um, the average depth, I think, is about four feet. Yeah. So they kind of taper up nice and gentle and slow. Um, so all around that that sort of tilled up soil area is, you know, one to two feet deep all around that area. And that's where most of the production takes place as far as phyto and zooplankton in that soil, or over top of that soil, I should say. 
Um, so, so that dry fertilization takes place a week to two weeks before we fill up the ponds and get them ready for walleye. Um, and then once the walleye are in the ponds, we'll do that 17 grams per cubic meter uh, every week, but we'll divide it into two applications. So on, on I think it's uh, on Monday we'll do half of it, and on Thursday we'll do the other half. And what we'll do is, so that we're not throwing soybeans right on top of fry and they can get away, we'll do kind of uh, one half of the pod, we'll spread it out on that soily part um, on the one day, and then we'll do the bottom half on the other day. That soybean, um, the soybean that we're applying weekly is a mix is mixed with water, and it's allowed to sit in, in uh, tubs out in the sun. And I'm sure you guys have seen it or dealt with it. It's a stinky, sloppy, disgusting mess. Um, so it ferments in the sun uh, for a week, and we do that every week. So once we empty that that for that uh, for that week, we'll fill it again right away, and it, and it sits there until the next. It makes the cow is drunk too, but they can handle it. Yeah. And the bears do good. The bears get into it. The people's pets. Do you fertilize our farm when it's full? Yeah. In the spring. Do you, do you, you don't do the initial? No. No. So, you, you, so uh, we work it up in the fall, like you were saying. Yeah. But we don't uh, drain it partially down in the spring, so we can have it to dry it. Hang on, I right. that. So could that be a lot of the reason we got so much growth in there? Uh, it could be. I think you guys you guys also raise rainbow trout in them for part of the year as well. Not the same one. Not, not the same one. No. Okay. Does some of that water come from no. the pond above? Yeah. Spring fed. Yeah. So if we drained it, you know, it's only spring fed, so it would take a while to fill that back. Yeah. Um, so you're saying you've got like algae problems and that sort of thing? Yeah, big time. Yeah. Um, I guess all I would recommend there is you may you may have to cut back the, on the amount of soybean that you're fertilizing with. Maybe it's just too much. Mm -hmm. um, I'll talk a little bit about that okay. when we get into into pond management and, and sort of when we um, when we continue to to add soybean and when we will stop because um, there's some sort of signs and signals that tell you you should stop. No manure? Uh, we don't use manure. No. I've heard of it. We want out nothing. Uh, I've heard of that too, but we haven't used that. Yeah. We have only use soybeans, so I can't speak to those other ones. So you say 17 grams per cubic meter, what's that? Area or? Uh, vol that's volume, of, volume of ponds. So you have to figure out the vol volume of each pond. Um, so to do that, you know, take a bunch of cross sections and take depths and then try to get an area, an idea of the area of the surface area, and then just multiply that out, and that'll give you the volume of each pond. Okay. So that, that'll that help you, that'll determine how much you fertilize with soybean. It also will help you determine how you try to put it in each pond. Because we've got sort of a number that we use, um, the number of fry uh, per cubic meter as well. So knowing the volume of your ponds is very important for a lot of different uh, parts of this. And that number for fry is 40 fry per cubic meter. We've tried a lot of, we've tried a lot of different uh, ones from 30 all the way up to 60, and 40 seems to be kind of a magic number for most ones. Um, any more than that, and, and they'll eat themselves out of house and home really quick, and you can't keep up. And any less than that, you can have uh, algae problems and O2 problems and that sort of thing. Let me know if I'm skipping anything here because I know it's Yeah, so here this this one talks about the, the dry fertilization and the, and the soybean application. Um, soybean's cheap. Um, it seems to be fairly consistent, so I think that's kind of why we stick with it. We know what it does. Um, and it's easy to get from any, any feed mill. I talked about fermenting soybean, um, oxygen and temperature, and I talked about that a little bit further on. Um, weekly sampling, so once we uh, once we put the fry in the ponds, um, I think for the first two weeks we don't do anything because they're still pretty tiny, but after about week three we'll start taking a small sand across the corner of a pond and try to harvest uh, 30 or 40 walleye 
and we'll bring them out and we'll measure and measure and weigh each one. And I was saying to the, the folks I was talking to yesterday, it's pretty important to write those two numbers down on a piece of paper rather than just looking at fish on a, you know, in a pail or on a, on a piece of paper. So write, write the numbers down, then you can actually look at the numbers. And if you start to see, um, if you start to see some size variation in those fish, you know that you're getting to a point where they're, they're eating themselves out of house and home and they're probably going to start to cannibalize pretty soon. So it's pretty important to track that weekly and kind of, kind of watch what's happening that way. <laughs> you do that with Sains? Yeah, we, we, we do it with Sains. So, um, yeah, you can't really see the... You can't really see, but there's a, there's a walkway in this building where our screen is at the bottom end. So we've got a Sains with a really long rope. And um, so we'll pass the rope around to somebody and they'll walk around the edge of the pond with the rope and then they'll pull the same across the corner really quickly. Because you know how fast walleye are, they'll get out of the way pretty fast. So you gotta yank it across really quickly and then you pull it in the same. And you usually have no problem catching 30 or 40 that way. Um, it just gives you a really good idea of what's going on in the pond. The, uh, the size difference that you're talking about how big is that? Is we got a temperature difference? Um, I don't want to answer that one right now. I don't. I don't have numbers to give you an example. Um, but when I get back, I can send you a sheet that that um, it's got some fish by a ruler, so it kind of shows it that way. But I've also got some numbers um, that can kind of show you when um, things start to get out of hand. Um, I can't. I, I don't want to say ten percent. I, I would only be guessing. Where do you get your sink? Um, competitive bidder. I think the last one was placed down near Simcoe somewhere. Um, something on that point. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I don't know what it costs. There was a place in Coburn. In Coburn. I don't know whether it's still there or not. Yeah. Last one we got was in Thunder Bay. Right. Which I don't we can go back there. We were, yeah, we were advised Wilkinson's in Minnesota. Yeah, yeah, there are there are some places in Ontario where you can. And I think they're. That'll be interesting. To yeah. Uh, so they, these are some of the sort of common critters that are that are in most ponds. Um, like I said, our our water comes from a lake, so there is a natural zooplankton pod 